stage had never run, almost never, I'd say almost never, and certainly never in the case of reporting, run anything like that before. I mean, its readers did not know that there was any sort of debate happening around gender affirming care. So it would have been a huge step to actually air that material. Whether they will be doing that now, I don't know. That'll be really interesting to see. Welcome to the New Flash Podcast, the podcast you deserve. My name is Ricky Orpike, and joining me once again is my fantastic friend, Mr. Jonathan Astro. John, how's it going? Good, yeah, Ricky. I got, I got you know, I got no complaints. Well, we have a fantastic guest today. Uh, Julie Zago is with us, and she is uh, it's sort of in the category of our guests that um, seems to be mounting up now of people who have been cancelled. It is a theme, isn't it? It's a bit of a theme that's that's reoccurring uh, over the last couple of months here. And I don't know, is is it a sign from the heavens that, that we're next? Maybe. Um, you go first. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to. I'll go with you. But, you know, but, it, but it's weird though. People, it seems you can get cancelled for a bunch of stuff. Like it's not like we're only interviewing red-pilled, you know, people or something like like you know people you can be a feminist like old school feminist like a fun someone who's like staunchly on the left mm. you know just i don't know it, it, i can't quite yeah. put it together so it seems like there must be a there's a secret set of of um rules that you need to abide by and you need to live your life in a certain way think certain things say certain certain things and then you'll you'll be fine like this is why I kind of wish I was I was woke, you know. Like I wish that I was a hundred percent woke, and I was just like, and all it was, and all we were talking about was how I could get more woke, you know. And then, what problems would you have? Zero do you think problems. your life would be easier? Absolutely, hundred percent. It's like being dumber. Like, do you know the people you know who are, yeah, they're dopey, right? You know the type. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, they're they're happier <laughs> than you. You know that there there is a, a an infamous film called The Idiots, which is very much like that. Von Trier, yeah. Lars von Trier, yeah, a group of people who pretend to be, I hate to use the word, but retarded, mm. for that same sort of reason. So because life's easier, they can get by much better. You know. Do you know whatever you say or whatever happens in the rest of this podcast doesn't matter because you said retarded. <laughs> Just. Turn turn the podcast off right now. Like turn your phone off, throw it in the river, like swear <laughs> to the clouds. <laughs> yes. yes, but anyway, you definitely would be happier. But but Julie's story is absolutely fascinating, and you know I might just tell her that her writing's pretty good. Oh, it's it's great. Yeah, I've really enjoyed uh, reading reading up on her stuff for for this show. Yeah, no, fan- she's fantastic. Let's get into it. Well, we need your help here at the New Flash Podcast. We need you to leave us a rating or review wherever you listen to the show. We're also on YouTube, so please subscribe to our YouTube channel and leave a comment about a show you liked or perhaps one that you didn't. Word of mouth is also a very powerful tool, so please tell all of your friends. And finally, to our Uber fans, if you love what we do, you can send us a little cash via the Buy Me A Coffee platform. Any donation here is very much appreciated. I'm actually quite thirsty, so you know I could do with a coffee right now. Let's get on with the show. Julie Sago started working as a lawyer before switching to writing and journalism. She wrote for The Age on and off for more than two decades as a social affairs reporter and senior writer. Most recently, uh, Julie was a weekly columnist for The Age before being sacked by the paper in June 2023 after calling out uh, the newspaper over its refusal to run her commissioned article on youth gender transition, which we are going to hear all about. She subsequently self-published the piece on Substack. Julie has uh, also taught journalism and creative nonfiction at RMIT and Monash University and is the author of a nonfiction book, The Tainted Trial of Farajama, which was shortlisted for the Victorian and New South Wales Premier's Literary Awards in 2015. Julie, welcome to The New Flesh. Good to be with you. So uh, we, we've got a lot to cover, t- uh, you know, uh, between the piece itself that you wrote and some of the fallout and perhaps what you're working on now. But before we get into all that, this is this is a, a personal uh, a question I'd like to ask you, well, personal from my standpoint, not, not not yours perhaps. Now, from your writing, you come across as a very level, level-headed and reasonable person. Uh, if, if I don't, mind, if you don't mind me saying so, you come across as pretty careful and considered. Uh, so, I'm going to get your advice on, on on an issue. Nothing kinky or weird. Okay. Um, <laughs> basically, I've developed a complete aversion to the ABC, our national broadcaster. 
It used to be, it, like, it was my go-to many years ago. Like, love the comedy. Like, I, I go way back. Like, like you know, not back way back as some, but I, I just grew up obsessed with Das Kapital and just loved it. all their, their comedy section, which is legendary, right? And then, you know, Q and A. When Q and A started, that was the place to be. We just, it was so good. Like, I remember just loving it, being addicted to it, and the Chaser. And now, I cannot even stand the Weather Report. Do you right. feel, do you ever feel like this or am I alone here? Well, first of all, uh, don't be scared of going to kinky or perverted. I am the daughter of a sex therapist, so <laughs> okay. I've been a lot about sex over the years, but we can get to that. In terms of the ABC, if I had a dollar for every time I hear someone say they cannot bear the ABC, as in it makes them break out in hives, I would be a very wealthy woman. Everyone, and this is across the board, um, and it's coming, I think, most vehemently from your traditional friends of the ABC type people, mm. so the kind of backbone of, of, you know, the listener community. And what all of them say without fail is that it is nauseatingly woke. I don't mm. know what else, what other word to use but that there is, it, it no longer has the texture of real life. Um, it sermonises, um, it's, it's, it's uh, whether, that's, whether that's radio, talkback radio, whether that is um, the things like Q&A as well, where they kind of set up these cockfights between people, but sometimes they're not even authentic either, you know. Um, I think there's been several ones on gender where they, they actually don't have an opposing view there. Um, I can't go into detail on that because I've stopped, I stopped watching Q&A some time ago myself, but I just noticed out of the corner of my eye. It's humorless as well, don't you think? Totally humorless. Totally humorless because there's all these issues that are just off limits. And the kind of issues that I write about now, I think, are uppermost. But the kind of unsayable, uh, unmentionable, there is just one line that can be run and there is no questioning what I would call gender identity ideology. I mean, it's not just in that area. I think there is that, that pathology is throughout the ABC. I mean, for instance, um, there was that enormous furor over... Stan Grant, um, who I think was unfairly singled out, and there's no doubt that there's a lot of uh, nasty people out there in social media land. But, for instance, I tuned in to the ABC's coverage of the coronation and I was almost throwing things at the TV within a few minutes. And it wasn't that I disagreed with any of the talking heads they had on who were talking about colonialism and so on, but it was, first of all, they were talking as the coverage itself was running, you know, and I wanted to hear some of that music, whatever. I had made a decision as a consenting adult to watch this thing and there was just this heavy-handed intrusiveness, you know, um, and I had, to, I had to switch to the BBC where it was just perfect. You know, there was no hype. Uh, there, was no, there, was no, there was none of that kind of heavy had to commentary either they just let me watch and they they sort of uh you know signposted things for me when they needed to and i wouldn't you know if we're going to head for a a no vote on the voice i reckon the abc might have a bit to answer for mm. i would even go so far as to say that but so yes as far as what you're what you're saying about people's perception about our national broadcaster it is spot on and it is widely held and I think the really disturbing aspect for me is I'm not sure that they know how much they have gotten the public offside I'm not sure they have that recognition do, do you think there's much of an appetite out there for a, a defunding of the ABC or for some sort of major reform of the ABC because I, I know you mentioned that the, the the sort of bias they have towards transgender reporting and that sort of stuff, but they're also politically they are all one way as well. They're left, you know, they're very biased against anything liberal, anything conservative out there as well. Do you think there's much appetite to shake things up? I don't think there's an appetite for something like defund the ABC. 
I think that that would that's very much a kind of American uh, kind of line. I don't think that flies here at all. And and even I mean I think I think there's even even sort of interference in, or a perception of interference in the ABC when the Liberal Party, for instance, that some of its attack, attack dogs uh, uh, criticise its coverage very sharply and, you know, where, where that kind of threat of cutting funding is sort of held over it or kind of allowed to hang there in the public discourse. I don't think people will go for that either because that's probably just a, a bridge too far for us here, but there's no doubt that there is intense dislike out there. Well, we could talk about the ABC all day, but we should probably move on. Uh, I'd love to get your thoughts on the Let Let Women Speak tour that happened uh, in Australia and New Zealand. Both John and I attended uh, this rally. Uh, John went, went, went to the Sydney one. I was there at the Melbourne one. And we were quite shocked to read the media coverage in the aftermath of this event, which which didn't match at all what we saw with our own eyes. Uh you know, why did did every mainstream Australian newspaper side with the trans right act, rights activists and 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 write essentially trans propaganda? I mean, was there even one journalist in one mainstream paper that wrote honestly about this? Yes, there was actually. Ironically, as it happens, the Age. There was a reporter in the Age. His name is Michael Bachelard, and I think he wrote a very fair report in the aftermath, in the immediate aftermath of the rally was the only one I, I saw in the progressive media, like you say. And again, it's one of these things that gets to you as soon as you start paying attention to this debate, right? So when you kind of walk into it, what you don't understand is the tone. The tone is just completely warped. So you look at the things that people are saying, you know, say the gender critical feminists, some of the people who are asking very reasonable questions about the trans activist agenda and you see the ferociousness of the response on the other side and you don't understand it. I hate to use the term gaslighting because it's a very overused term but but that's kind of what it's like. You think well uh, there must be something about this that I'm not getting. You know, So a colleague of mine, a, a journalist, described it as you start to think that it must be you guilty of wrong speak and that kind of dynamic was here with uh, Posey Parker's tour as well. I'm going to have to say I don't like her. I feel a little bit guilty saying that because who cares or just a bit stupid. Who cares who I like and who I don't like? I don't like the way she campaigns. Um, I think it's unnecessarily provocative and she veers into the nasty too many times for my liking. But nevertheless, she comes with a very potent message, which is let women speak. And as we know, the opponents of gender identity ideology haven't been given a, a seat at the table at all. You know, they haven't been able to get their op-eds for the most part run in the progressive press. The ABC will not go near them and indeed demonises them on occasion. And so when Posey Parker says, basically just kind of sets up a microphone in the middle of the city and says, come and say your bit about whatever it is that's bothering you, be it you know, sex offenders, male sex offenders in women's prisons, be it uh, the kind of minor epidemic in teenagers, especially teenage girls coming out as trans and the, the kind of lack of realism perhaps in the response to that in parts of the medical profession, whether it is, um, uh, you know, males in female sports and so on, then women are going to jump at the chance to do that. Ordinary women who are not bigoted, they're just, they've just been driven to a point of serious resentment from not being able to voice what most of the population would regard as very reasonable views. But again, like you said, we had this, we had from the start this reporting that depicted Posey Parker and, you know, more to the point, the women who attended these rallies as monsters, <laughs> effectively, you know, as bigots, as hateful people. And then I think when the Nazi, the neo-Nazis turned up and that gave their salute, I think there was a temptation to kind of work backwards from that. That's certainly what the politicians in 
Victoria did, for instance. Um, Premier Dan Andrews and the opposition leader, John Pesuto, they said they, they kind of constructed this narrative after the fact that actually the people who were there protesting were somehow sympathetic to the Nazis or, you know, part of the same kind of movement. So it kind of became this self-fulfilling prophecy, I suppose. It's so disillusioning, really. I mean, I, I, I don't want to single anyone out, but, you know, one of the journalists I read, you know, I don't even know why I was reading the West Australian movies because we've got West Australian roots, but there was a journalist in the West Australian who covered some of this and or, or, or at least maybe they covered the, um, the Perth one or whatever, and I think they'd written about it. And I just remember reading the, the coverage just... I was so outraged because... Um, the it was like this person hadn't they hadn't listened to any of the major players like they didn't know who they they hadn't well look I think maybe you should, you could you could easily dip into one of Kelly J's live streams here and there and go oh yes and just like you just like you you could say yeah oh, she's a she's a nasty woman she's uncouth and, and whatever and and I don't like it me not uh, uh, but uh, you know they didn't look into you know a, a range of the other people let alone listen to the women and so some of the claims being made like about uh, you know what what kind of event this was and, and who it was for was seemed so outraged to the point where I was like I, I was confused as to whether what kind of like if I worked with that journalist and I'd read that piece. I'd be, I'd be really worried for them. I'd be like, wow, they, they live in a parallel universe where they're, they're seeing the world completely different to me. Like they, like they're not list. They didn't listen to any of the stories of the women. They don't know who Angie Jones is. Like they, they're willing to call someone like Angie Jones um, on the. If you say that Angie Jones is right wing, <laughs> then you, you can say, you could say. But I'm, I look just like me, me and Ricky. You could criticize us about a range of different things. You could criticize Angie about the way she tweets or whatever. But if you call her right wing, where we are on different different planets. I mean, what do you, what do you make of all this? Well, just on the, on Angie Jones, that was that's. An extraordinary and just despicable um, example of vilification. She wasn't just called right wing. She was effectively called a Nazi sympathiser by the leader of the, the Liberal, by the Parliamentary Liberal Party, mm. Liberal Opposition in Melbourne. Um, that is extraordinary. And it was all on the basis of one moronic tweet where, you know, she, she said something like, oh, you know, we all care about, we all want the pedos to go away and the Nazis do, so why don't you? I mean, in the context of some stupid conversation she was having with someone, which anyone who is on Twitter does from time to time, is that all it takes to have you labelled a Nazi sympathiser in Victoria in 2023, one dumb tweet? So, uh, yeah, that's really interesting about what you say about parallel universes. I I don't know. Maybe her editor didn't know much. Didn't say her, <laughs> but you. Yeah. <laughs> that, but it wasn't. <laughs> Good work, Julie. That's you fell into my trap. <laughs> That's interesting. Yes, I did. I did assume her, but you're you know you're right. You're right. I shouldn't have done that. But did this person, this journalist's editor, know much about the issues? Why wouldn't they want to know, though? It's a, this is fascinating. This stuff is absolutely fascinating. Like when you really start, as your pieces have have really, you know, gone into how fascinating it is. I mean, there, there's a lot going on here. Um, why wouldn't you be – the word that comes to mind is uncurious. I, f I find a lot of the reporting on this very uncurious. A lot of the, the reporting, if not almost all of the reporting outside of, say, the Murdoch media, which has been running hard on it for a while, and in the Australian particularly, running hard on it very well with some very good reporting. Uncurious is certainly the word. Um, it is not the reality. It's just that the forces that put pressure on journalists and editors are very strong and it makes everything very difficult, As and my experience attests to this. So... Well, perhaps before we get get into the the, uh, the, the actual uh, the piece that you wrote that that ended up getting you sacked from the Age, we we wanted to ask you about the nuts and bolts of journalism in Australia, particularly because you've seen seen the industry change quite dramatically over the past couple of decades. You know, first we'd like to know what what the process is like going from having a story idea to getting it published in a major Australian newspaper. Can you step us through this? 
I don't think I can, I'm afraid, and that is because I'm a freelancer and although I've been writing a weekly column for nearly 10 years now for The Age and the odd other thing, I do it from a distance. So I took a voluntary redundancy in 2013, 2012, and then the kind of the sort of digital operation was nowhere near as developed as it, as it is now. So it was only kind of starting, starting to sort of head towards this idea of constant rolling reporting, constant filing throughout the day, stories being updated and so on. The newsroom was still sort of trying to be configured around this, but it was, it was very much a work in progress at that point. So I haven't been around in recent years when it's a whole new game as far as that goes. In my time, uh, chief of staff would commission a piece from you and you would have all day to write it and you'd have to file it about four o'clock or so and after you filed it, that piece would be seen by, oh, I don't know, six pairs of eyes, um, a whole table, t- down table of, of sub-editors, uh, night editor and so on, copy editors, until before it appeared in the paper. And you could, you could rely on, most of the time, uh, people having your back, errors being picked up. Uh, and sometimes if, if there was a problem in your, in your reasoning or there was a gap in your reporting or a hole, you would hear from somebody who would say, don't you think that that lead's wrong? Or when that person said that, uh, what proof, you know, did you check that claim? So I well, imagine it was, it that was that's my lived of... experience is my answer. I'd say it was, it was, <laughs> there are other ways of knowing and it's my lived experience and then I'd probably get you fired somehow. Sure. Well... Things were different back then. That's all I can say. Yeah, right. Sounds like um, a, sounds like barbaric to me. But if I can't talk about it, was it was know. really barbaric? It was barbaric, and I used to just shit myself. Something chronic. I used to be just so scared of those sub editors, particularly those sub editors on the business desk. For some reason, they they <laughs> really just frightened the shit out of me. Um, you know, it was very. It was very, I felt very ashamed when, you know, when they would come up to me and say, that is bloody wrong, you stupid idiot, you know. But at the same time, I felt very secure knowing that 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 whole backup system was there. So in terms of how things are done now, I can't say. Okay. Well, I say we get into it. Uh, We'd love to know uh, what got you uh, let go from a weekly column at The Age. Well, it was a very slow process. So it was probably two years in the making. And it all started when uh, I got promoted to a weekly columnist. I had been fortnightly before then. And the previous editor of The Age, a woman called Gay Alcorn, wanted to get me writing some longer form stuff, some features as well. And she actually kind of gave me a bit of money and then said, oh, we'll figure out what you're going to write about. And then she said to me, you know, there's this case in the UK where a court has decided that kids under the age of 16 can't give informed consent to puberty blockers. She said, isn't that interesting? That's quite different to our situation here in Australia. We we seem to have something called the affirmation model. And maybe, maybe our way of doing things is right, but it's interesting, isn't it? And I said to her, yeah, that sounds interesting. Famous last words. Cue the scary music. I was doing scary music as, as while you were talking. I was, so I'm picturing the the TV movie that we'll make about it, and the, the just the, the padded music. Ricky, were you hearing that music? Oh yeah. What, yeah. When you asked, yeah, good. Yeah, you're what about you're about to step down the rabbit hole. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. I really was. Yeah, and so this was. Oh, I mean, I'm embarrassed to say it, but it was like it was after the first Bell v Tavistock decision. So it was, it was a decision um, of the UK High Court, and I think this was around December 2020, and I didn't do anything for, oh, no. So this was a few months after that, okay, so it wasn't that far back. And it was just before that decision got kind of overturned on the appeal around that time. And I, so I start looking into this area. Now, I didn't know anything about paediatric transition. I would see these kids uh, being transitioned and think and have a kind of odd 
unsettled feeling, I suppose, or just a, a, a somewhat confused feeling. But I, I thought, well, I clearly don't understand it. And obviously, the doctors know what they're doing. It's what I assumed. Uh, and I, I didn't know much about trans issues generally. I think I'd written one column and that was when Julie Bindle, the British radical feminist, came to do I well, no, she didn't. Uh, she was kind of cancelled three years after the fact from an appearance that she had made at Reading's Bookstore in Melbourne because the, the head of the store started cutting, coming under heat for the fact that he had given her a platform three years ago, I think by a queer writer who was about to do an event, and so he apologised for having hosted her, you know, all those years ago. And then he went back on the apology and it was all a bit crazy. And I think at that point I, I knew a little bit about J.K. Rowling and some of these disputes about the, the conflict between sex and gender identity, okay? So the, uh, the kind of debates about whether... Somebody can just say, say a man can just say that they're a woman and that they should be given, therefore, all the legal rights of a woman, including access to female spaces and so on. And I was very sympathetic to both sides, very empathetic, and I, I wrote a nice piece about it. That was it. And so anyway, I was given this, this project now on paediatric transition, started looking into it, and again had that same feeling of I don't understand this it's it's not making sense to me and again it wasn't so much that the actual science or the debates about the science weren't making sense to me it was the tone of the debate that just threw me um, for instance uh, it became very clear to me that uh, some of the the kind of uh, fraught context in this area was that there was a new class or a new cohort of young person turning up to gender clinics. That new cohort was essentially adolescent girls. And that this was different from what had happened in the past where most of the, the gender clinicians for the most part saw prepubescent boys who had been kind of, I suppose, feminine boys for quite some time. And these were adolescent girls who appeared to have no verifiable history of having been gender non-conforming as kids. And they had a whole lot of other problems, complex problems often. So they had they were on the autism spectrum or they had ADHD or they had uh, trauma, eating disorders and so on. And so I sort of saw this and, 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 and so this new cohort meant that people, people weren't entirely sure whether the kind of research that we had done on trans kids in the past and the kind of procedures that had been developed that would facilitate, you know, cross-sex hormones, puberty blockers and all that were really applicable to this new, new group of people. And so one of the issues that, that is there, was there in the debate was, well, why, why are we seeing so many of these girls turning up? Why are we seeing so many people so many more kids turn up generally. So why are the numbers of people going to gender clinics uh, sort of exponentially higher than they were just a few years ago? And the the, the sort of the the people from the us I'd say from the affirmation camp, so the kind of um, people in the profession who um, who see it as their mission to to help trans kids say that, well, this is because there's less stigma around these things now and trans has become more visible so people are more comfortable naming, naming their feelings and coming forward for help. It's the, mad, it's the mad men view of history where everything from literally five minutes ago was like, it's like, it's 20, it's 2012 and it was like, get me my dinner, smack the wife. Like that's what it was like then and now, right <laughs> now, it's beautiful and there's just more kids coming out going, I feel like I'm trans. That's the, that's the <laughs> view that I seem to get from some of these people. Right. So that is a view that they, that they express. Um, and, but, and I should say that, that that is a view that gets expressed, I guess, publicly, um, but is not necessarily 
what's what they really think. But certainly that's what I would say the mainstream orthodox, you know, gender affirmation professionals would say. One thing that's always, you know, fascinated me is that you often have groups of girls that come out trans together. So you get six girls in one class that would come out as, as trans. Like, like if, if it really is a case of, oh, we just live in a tolerant society now and these sorts of people can just sort of come out, wouldn't they be distributed fairly evenly around society? I mean, why, why do six girls in the same class s- somehow come out as trans? You know that- Right. So, so against this, against this argument that everybody is just now just feels more free to be able to express themselves and say who they are and come forward is a, a view that was first expounded by a woman called Lisa Littman, a researcher in the US, who did a paper on social contagion, essentially. So she started noticing exactly what she said, that there were these clusters of girls, um, the same friendship groups or online groups, coming out as trans at the same time and she sort of coined this term rapid onset gender dysphoria but basically basically what she was saying was that this is a social a a social uh phenomenon you know that this was um spread through the internet uh and and then a number of people kind of refined this as well um and there's a woman called a woman, a Philadelphia therapist called Lisa Marciano. And what she says really rings true to me. She says that basically this idea of gender dysphoria has become part of our collective symptom pool. She's a Jungian therapist, this woman. So she says that adolescent girls who may be distressed for all sorts of reasons will subconsciously kind of park their distress in this category called trans because they know that their distress will be taken seriously. You know? um, so it's become this kind of category where a number of people will buy in for various reasons. Now that to me seems, all of that to me seemed to align with my, my own lived experience <laughs> in the world. Um, as a journalist, as a mother, uh, it seemed to align with everything we know about teenage girls and the effect of social influence and their various maladaptive behaviours and so on. But you would read the kind of response from, I would say, the trans lobby generally to this social contagion theory, and it was wild. I mean, there was a woman who wrote a book in the US um, called Transgender. How can I forget the name of the book? It'll come to me. It'll come to me. It's big. She wrote a book called Irreversible Damage. Sorry. Abigail Schreier. Abigail Schreier. Yeah. Abigail Schreier. Oh, my God. Early onset dementia. Abigail Schreier. Um, yeah, Irreversible Damage, the transgender craze afflicting our girls, something like that. And she and 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 sort of there were there were people who had who had the rhetoric. The rhetoric um, against her was just unbelievable. And I think there was an independent bookseller who had to apologise for distributing her books and said something to the effect of that was a serious, violent incident that we sold her books. Um, And so it was this kind of dialed up response all the time that just threw me. And I got, again, very confused. I thought there must be something here I'm missing and at that, t- at that stage, I, I, didn't, I couldn't find my feet in the topic. I couldn't work out who I trusted and what weight to give things. I was so lost that actually I just didn't do anything. And I just read a lot, listened, you know, listened to uh, a lot of talks, a lot of podcasts, read books, tried to talk to as many people as I could. And then eventually I realised that, that the landscape was shifting really quickly. So that was when um, health authorities in the UK, in Scandinavian countries, really were tightening access to puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones. And there was even a rethinking of social transitioning of kids. And it then became clear to me that this was a real thing. This, This debate was real. It was not. There weren't just fringe players who were uh, criticising from the sidelines. And I think at that point I that was when I wrote the piece, but between 
being commissioned to write the piece and producing the piece and giving it to uh, a new editor because the previous editor had to step down for personal reasons. A lot happened in the in the interim. Well, Julie, you seem to have done done your research, and you know you've got books and and research papers sort of up your sleeve to back up your piece. So why why was it then uh, not not published? I mean, I'm I'm sure you would have had a fairly balanced, nuanced view after all that work that you'd you'd put in. I did, I did, and I still do. Um, I the very fact that I'm saying that there is a debate means that I can see that there are two sides. Um, I don't need to say that those two sides are equal. I just need to be able to understand and explain the thinking on both sides and and grapple with the truth, you know, try and get close as close as we can to the truth. And I think I did that really well. Um, I think I was very proud of the piece that I gave to the editor. And he agreed that, in fact, the piece was good. Well, he didn't, well, he didn't say much about the piece. He just said, he said, it's good, it's not, there's no problem with the piece. But he said that he couldn't run it under my name because there would be a perception of bias and that this would damage the reputation of the masthead. What would it run under then? Like if it's not your name, what would we, what would it just say staff writers, the age? Well, I mean, my understanding is that since then he's, he's commissioned or is commissioning other reporters at the paper to essentially write the same kind of story. Could you have gone under a, a pseudonym? Well, I wasn't going to do that. No, uh, I don't. I don't think that would have been. That certainly that offer was not on the table, and the reality is that I the, the the material that I put into that piece essentially put everything on the table, laid everything bare, everything about the debate. Um, said there's this, and then there's that, and the age had never run. Almost never, I'd say almost never, and certainly never in the case of reporting, run anything like that before. I mean, its readers did not know that there was any sort of debate happening around gender affirming care. So it would have been a huge step to actually air that material. And whether they whether they will be doing that now, I don't know. That'll be really interesting to see. But you turned it in, and you were given this. Uh, I'm also interested in how this communication happened. Is this happening by email? Sorry, I should I should go back a little bit. Uh, when I say that the Age had never published anything about this, um, that's actually not not quite right. I I have been writing the odd op-ed on the issue as well as a columnist, and one of them had a got a very strong response from trans activists. And a complaint was brought to the press council and so on. So I was running into a bit of trouble as far as that went. But then what I also did was I found out about a detransitioner in Sydney who was suing her psychiatrist for negligence, you know, for um, waving waving her through to uh, radical surgery and so on without properly evaluating her mental health. Now, I, I learnt about that story through my research for this paediatric transition piece and gave it to the paper and it did run on the front page of both The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald, but that also created a huge stink internally, externally as well, but particularly internally at The Age among some of the journalists. Without, without you know, obviously getting yourself in any hot water and, you know, you want to be kind to your former colleagues and that, can you give us a sense of, of, of the kind of division we're talking about here? Because that's so nebulous. Like, is it is – because it, my mind immediately goes to a cabal of younger staffers who run a collective there. So if that's wrong, you know, are we talking like individual, like big time journalists, old school who were like, Julie, you got it wrong here. Or are we talking about young people who, who studied postmodernism? You certainly have, uh, it's certainly not the old school people. I can say that definitely. For the most part, maybe with a few exceptions, but for the most part, I think we're talking about younger journalists. I know one or two names but as to the real scale of this, I can't say. So I can't say I've heard different reports. I've heard that it's really just 
very small number of zealous individuals to it's everybody under 30 to it's half the newsroom. So I don't know. But when I was writing, when that when that story about the detransition, I was in the editing process, I mean, trans activist talking points just suddenly ended up in the copy, you know. Um, and so, I mean, that was that... I think also write, writing that piece and writing that other column that had the strong pushback, uh, to put it crudely, I think marked me out as some kind of turf, so trans-exclusionary radical feminist within the ranks of the newsroom. So, Julie, when you say like trans talking points were were cropped up in your work, so someone someone has altered your work then and in, in, inserted stuff in there? I mean, how common is yes. that? Yes, uh, that is... I mean, it is common for a piece to be edited and refined in various ways, but no, I have never experienced a new line just being thrown in there um, and it was something to the effect of uh, trans trans activists accuse, um, say that highlighting the stories of detransitioners is a something like plays into the hands of the political right or is a plot by the political right elegant. to delegitimise gender dysphoria. I mean, to be honest, they couldn't even get their own bloody talking points right. I mean, the way they the way they kind of express themselves wasn't even um, correct on their own terms. Uh, but, I, I mean, I cracked the sh- I nearly pulled the story. Mm. I cracked the shits about it. But um, I think that... That was it. Was another episode that perhaps had that kind of gave rise to this perception that I my name was somehow suspect um, on the, on this issue, and that they couldn't run the piece under my byline. And so then, did you make the decision to to say, okay, well, I'm going to self publish? I told the editor that I'd be doing that. I said, well, I'm going, to st- I'm going to self-publish on my Substack and I'm going to say that you refuse to publish it. And he initially said something like, oh, really, do you have to do that? I said, of course I have to do that. Uh, it's, you know, it's my professional reputation on the line here as well. And I did that. And when I did that, I also launched my Substack generally. And I had, and I made a cheeky comment about how I was going to be writing about gender identity issues more broadly uh, and without a committee of woke journalists redacting words they don't like, such as male. Now, that actually did happen. So it did happen in that column, the one that caused the great pushback and the complaint to the press council. I had talked about uh, women women being under pressure to accept uh, non-surgically transitioned males in their spaces and that was considered for Bolton and it was changed to people which made just the sentence weird I mean the meaning fuzzy uh and anyway but I so I had made this cheeky comment about the work committee of journalists and the editor who was overseas at the time he tried to call me but I didn't I didn't hear the phone call and sent a text saying that uh, I was, he can't have columnists for the paper disparaging the paper and so he won't be commissioning any more columns from me. And then your substack was born. It was, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that's interesting. Like, you know, Freud would say there are no accidents. Uh, so when you were yeah. composing that, um, the comment about the, you know, the work journalist, did, did you know on some level, were you, were you, were you going for it? Throwing down a bit? I think you should be. <laughs> That's what I'm just saying. It's like you've justified throwing down. I'm just saying, did you know on some level, like now that you've looked at it, you're like, oh, I knew. I thought, not to swear, but fuck them. Look, I knew it was cheeky, but then again, I mean, there have, there have been columnists who write for the paper and there was, there was an example just recently of an arts columnist, people reminded me of this, who had criticised the paper's coverage on a particular issue. I mean, he wasn't sacked. So, I mean, it was a fairly mild remark. Uh, It didn't come immediately after my publishing, my announcement that I was publishing the piece, you know, so it sort of came uh, 
further further down, you know. Yes, it wasn't I'm necessarily- conflating it in my head like I'm making I'm already making that TV movie, you see. <laughs> so and they're gonna have these two scenes are gonna happen straight after the other, whereas there was a bit of time. Look, it's fair to say that the relationship between me and the paper had already broken down. So at the at the point where I did all this, I had gone off again on a long period of sulk leave. The second I loved that line in your yes, in your yeah. description. You say this is in your piece. You say I went on sulk an extended sulk leave, and I'm like, perfect. Great. Yes, yes. <laughs> so I did that this time because I was just getting extremely frustrated, quite depressed actually. Um, you know, I wasn't. I wasn't going to be writing about, I, I had no desire to write about trans every week. I mean, I know how to keep my obsessions more or less under control. I am a very zealous adv- advocate, for instance, for public education. I knew the paper didn't like those pieces very much, but I knew that every now and then they would let me go there. I'd, I'd do the same on this issue, but I wasn't allowed to go there at all. Um, so it became clear to me that not only was the piece not going to be run, not only was I not able to report on trans issues, I wasn't allowed to commentate on those on them either. And so, you know, when all you want to do is kind of write about something that you think is important and relevant and that your readership, in fact, um, is desperate to read. Mm. Well, what, what's the response been? What's the response been to, to, to the piece? To the piece itself, I think it's been overwhelmingly positive from what I can tell. Um, it was featured, I mean, my, my sacking was featured on a Media Watch episode and uh, Paul Barry said that, that in his view the piece seemed to be cautious and considered and so on. Um, I mean, the, the, trans, the trans lobby were very angry about, about things that were in there but... I'm glad you were on Media Watch too and you didn't let them pick a silly voice for you because it would have gone, you know, it was like, <laughs> I thought the piece was, and you know, really. <laughs> yeah. they, they, they always pick an annoying actor when they want to stick it to you at Media Watch. That's one of their little tricks. Yes. Look, I did see some of the perhaps less, oh, look, no, don't worry, I won't go there. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, do, do you have any sense of, of, of how many journalists are out there that are in a similar position to you, either, you know, stifled by editors or, or on the brink of being fired or, or perhaps have quit because they can't report honestly anymore? Are, you know, are there more people like you out there? Good question. I'm not sure that there are people who are as reckless as me. So I'm not sure that there are people who are prepared to take it the whole way and are pushing to be able to do this kind of reporting. But there are certainly people who attest to there being a climate of fear and exceptionalism around this issue. So I have had, you know, ABC journalists contact me and say, I can't discuss this among my colleagues, only among a very few number of trusted people because I'm scared of being internally cancelled. Mm. Um, and I think at the Guardian, you know, yeah, I've had I've had a bit of kind of coded communication from the odd person that suggests that they are perhaps more sympathetic to my point of view than uh, I might think. I mean, I think definitely there is there there are definitely people who know that something is wrong. I think at the age. There are a great number of people who know something is wrong. But I think there are just so many factors in play here. And some of it is stuff that doesn't necessarily bother most editors, but some will be more sensitive, for instance, to Twitter campaigns, activists mobilising against the paper and so on. That's happened before. Generally speaking, generally speaking, a lot of editors do want don't want unnecessary hassle in their lives and they know that uh, when they run copy on this issue there will be you know, a very high chance of press counsel to complaints that they then have to defend. So it's an extra level of hassle. And then on top of that you factor in the fact that there is internal, um, likely to be internal strife um, and, you know, possibly even an uprising like we've seen at the at the Guardian um, and other places, and it just makes it too hard. You know, it's not that they're ideologues. It's not the kind of senior editors have have suddenly decided that 
you know, they have, uh, they're kind of evangelical about this issue in some way. Not at all. Mm. But what, what's, what's a little bit concerning to me is that the issue that, that you're writing about, which is, is the transitioning of kids, could potentially be one of the biggest medical scandals of, of our times, quite, quite possibly. And there are editors at newspapers who are concerned about mean tweets or activists, you know, getting together and, and, and making a sign or something, you know, I mean. No, it's the internal letter. It's the collective letter. That's, that's, that's the special move of the, the staff collective is to go, we're going to write a whiny letter about how Julie Sago's a meanie. And then that's, how, that's what happens. Yeah, that's true. And, again, it's one of the weird things about this whole space, which is that here is a story that could be an extraordinary story, like you say. It's certainly possible. I mean, I mean, I would say put I would put that possibility at say fifty fifty. There's a fifty percent chance that this may in fact be one of the biggest turn out to be one of the biggest medical scandals in history. And here, uh, here are media organisations running away from the story rather than to the story. It is <laughs> extremely odd. Well, I've got I've got a bit of a Hollywood brain, as you've already guessed, and so uh, when I come to these issues, it's really it's really difficult to to see. Um, you know, I understand that there are realities out there, and you've got to you know p- run a certain amount of fluff pieces and whatever. I, I get that, and you don't want hassle here and there. But in terms of the running of the newspaper and who we hire and what we talk about there, I mean, is it too Sorkin esque? or too, you know, old school to say that truth matters and that truth is a thing we should be aspiring to and that, and we should follow it wherever it goes, you know, without fear or favour. You know, obviously there'll be the, the, the time when it runs into a sponsor or something and then, okay, I get that. But when it comes to, like, you're going to have some, some um, activist journalist next to me at the desk, well, assuming we work there, or just doing it by email, and they're going to they're gonna make a claim could be any claim that we've we've heard over the last few years which doesn't quite add up whether it's about um you know police um action in america or stuff that we've got data on stuff that you go like that you go well actually the the data from objective sort from your sources really that you should be looking into says this and it could be about all this stuff that you've looked into you just go well the data actually says this so, like it could be a simple one like that little one that was in what you mentioned in one of your pieces which is uh, richard dawkins talking about intersex about the actual you know, prevalence of intersex as opposed to the the talking point that we always hear of that number. So you, we're going to have someone who is so committed to an ideological cause. I, I don't understand why there isn't a witch hunt against those people. Like, like, like those people are clearly compromised. Like if you're, you should be, I mean, you're one of the only voices who I've read who's actually probably willing to criticise the, the gender critical side as well, like to actually maybe throw a few wax out there where, where, where it's needed as well because that's where we need to get to in journalism, right? It's got to be, a, you know, somewhere in the middle. So, I mean, what, what do you think? Shouldn't, should, should there not be uh, some kind of uh, uh, moment of reckoning where, we, we, where people can grow a set and, and maybe run some of these ideologues out of town and make them embarrassed, to make them embarrassed for choosing to get into journalism for the wrong reasons? Yeah, I mean, I agree. I, I don't know what the answer is. I mean, I taught journalism for quite a few years at university and, you know, I certainly kind of sensed that I had to be very careful. Um, you know, it's, it's sometimes that feeling was more pronounced than at other times, that, uh, that, that you're kind of walking on eggshells a little bit with what you say to the group, um, especially around anything to do with identity politics. And I think in newsrooms they've become pretty bottom heavy in the in recent years. So with all the cost cuttings and with all the redundancies, the kind of old guard who you're talking about, who are not ideological, um, who just care about the story, who are really the without fear or favour people, um, their kind of the their ranks have thinned quite a bit. And I don't want to typecast at all these younger journalists as being ideologues in any way. But maybe all you need are just a few of them. 
um, who make a loud noise and the rest of them don't particularly want to ruffle feathers. I don't know. But so clearly something, clearly something is going wrong. Something is going wrong across all our institutions. These governments who just uh, have also um, effectively abandoned their duty to be honest brokers when it comes to introducing a whole lot of laws, uh, I mean, what are they doing? You know, why are they introducing gender self-ID laws without any kind of guardrails around it for safeguarding um, Introducing, I think, quite quite problematic legislation around conversion therapy. You know, why are they essentially giving activist groups everything they want? That's not their job. Yeah. Well, we need we need strong journalists to 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 hold up a lantern to what what some of these politicians are doing. But but I wanted to know your view on this. Like, why do you need a university degree to be a journalist? I mean, I mean, in, in, in the old days, it was more of an apprenticeship. That is an excellent question. And I think you have, you know, you have definitely zeroed in on one of the problems here. You don't. And, and, I, and I've come to the view that in some ways it's probably counterproductive to have one. So the old school of journos that, who we had learnt on the job and didn't have, I guess, the, the, the kind of theory um, and uh, the sort of mindset that maybe you do acquire at universities these days. Again, I don't want to typecast. I, I you know, I think I'm, I'm not sure whether, you know, I. There are some fantastic younger journalists generally, but there are there are certainly some problems around particular areas to do with identity politics, which has come to define what it means to be a progressive these days. Mm. Well, that, that kind of situation that, that, that you described earlier with, with getting feedback from sub-editors and editors and, and sort of this back and forth, I mean, that seems like just a, a, an amazing way to learn how to be a journalist by doing it, getting that f- direct feedback from someone, redoing it, reworking a story, coming back, or maybe shadowing someone a little bit as well. I mean, that to me sounds like uh, not, not, not only a, a more enjoyable way perhaps to learn how to be a journalist, but also you know, one one that could be more fruitful. Definitely. And it, like what you said before, when you when you talked about why do you need a university degree, I think it, the, you, there used to be a much more working class flavour to the profession that there is now, where you do have to have a university degree. But I suppose you do for everything these days. But, but, to, but to circle back to the, to the ABC, for instance, example, because like, I've had a... a Producer asked me at one point, you know, it's a intelli- t- television producer, so they state to do a diversity statement or something and they're doing something with the ABC or whatever. I said, well, what you should do is, you know, you should say um, I'm what I'm going to do, this is my diversity initiative, I'm going to go in, I'm going to say put up your hands if you've got a university degree and then, and then you get 60% of the people in the room or 50% of the room who've got their hands up to get that and you fire them and you fire them and you say you're fired and you say you are a coastal elite you have n- you have no business talking about the re- the country as a whole. You don't represent the country. You 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 are privileged. You you know you 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 come from a, a class. You know that uh, you know frankly um, you know we've got too many of in this organisation. So we're calling you down. And so thank you for your work and goodbye. And uh, obviously they didn't like this answer. I think they were looking for me to say <laughs> just we should get some more people of colour or something. Which is uh, maybe you should do that as well. I'm just saying that this would be maybe we can kill two birds with one stone. Well, there's definitely become this massive blind spot in the whole diversity inclusion industry where uh, it's become where, you know, a lot of employers think it's all about, you know, let's pick an Asian person and let's have a black person and let's have gay people and so on. And it's all about that kind of superficial diversity and not diversity of thought or, like you say, yeah, diversity of socioeconomic background that is often bottom of the list. Well, we're very mindful of time here, Julie, uh, but I wanted to get your take maybe big picture and what you think the future of journalism is. I don't know. I mean, I think there's going to be fewer and fewer jobs at legacy media. So, I mean, in some ways, in some ways the, the, the barriers for entry have never been lower. Anyone can set up their substack. 
you know, anyone can set up their blog, their podcast and so on. Um, the big question is how does it pay um, and what is the future of the profession now that the business model has sort of, you know, fallen, you know, the bottom has fallen through the business model with the transition um, to digital technologies. So I'm not sure I can answer, I'm not sure I can answer the question, but I think I'm an optimist uh, because there has to be. Uh, I mean, in some ways, there there just has to be the kind of journalism that people want to read because the demand will be there, and in some way, it will be delivered. So, so maybe I'm a bit of a market market optimist in that well, sense. I wanted to give you the final word, uh, Julie. For, but you know, my take on this, or well, at least my, my read on it, is that you know, you wrote some naughty things. And then you got, uh, you know, run out of town on a rail. And a lot of people who listen to this, we, we've got a growing uh, uh, listenership here, and um, including my wife, who, you know, who tunes in every now and then. And a lot of these people are normies. And we know some of these people listen. And they're in normal jobs out there. They're, they're, in, they're speeches and they work in TV and they work in HR and all this stuff. A lot of women actually. And so uh, I wonder if you could give them some insight in what it's like to reach a T-junction where you have to speak your mind and you have to say you're forced into saying that thing. I mean, because a lot of them every day are in this. They're getting asked to, you know, look, it's, it's, it's trivial on one level, but they're getting asked to do their pronouns. That's the start of it. And then it could be something way more serious where they're getting asked to sign up to stuff that they don't believe in. So, you know, what, what's your advice for people in this position? They're on the other side of it. You're, you, you are, you've gone through this. So what do, you, what do you reckon? Yeah. And, look, I have tremendous sympathy for people who, you know, they have to put food on the table, they've got a mortgage. I've got all those things as well. Uh, but I've got a partner and he has a job and we're economically okay so I can I can take a bit of a hit in the short term, I guess, and not everyone can do that. So I think everybody has to make a calculation of what they're prepared to put up with for the sake of, you know, being able to live for sure. I guess, I mean, for me, it just became unsustainable. To be a columnist, to have that, that kind of privileged position and to not be allowed to say what you want to say, um, to be muzzled, for there to be this kind of major issue out there that's of concern for a lot of people and you can't tackle it. In the end, I just couldn't, I couldn't live with that contradiction. And a lot of people would say to me things like, are you sure that trans is the hill that you want to die on? Because I think at some point it became clear that I was on a bit of a collision course with the paper on this question. And I find that a really, uh, I find it a really irritating question because in a sense like, okay, so if I said, well, I, I, all right, I am, I'm not going to die on the hill of trans. I've decided that that's not enough of a hill to die on. Well, I'm still going about my daily life and I've decided that that hill, that there are hills I now won't die on. I've set that precedent. So what am I going to do when the next hill presents itself, whatever that might be? Now that I've kind of uh, sort of decided in my head that there are some that there are some aspects of of telling the truth and the responsibility to be a truth teller that are actually negotiable, I think it just comes comes to the point where there are just too many contradictions. As far as these people who it, this is not kind of central to their job, whether they put their pronouns down the bottom of you know their emails or not. I would just suggest to them that if they're feeling so incredibly uh, pissed off by this, they're not the only ones. <laughs> um, and I think great things could come of, of speaking out about that. I mean, we've put up with too much of this shit, all of us, in all our workplaces. Um, and I think that the powers that be have to start encountering some real resistance um, or else we're, we're just all losing our marbles as a society. We're losing our bearings, you know. Not sure if that answers your question. It does, it does yeah. <laughs> so we, we have a final uh, question that we ask all of our guests and we'd like to know what you're reading right now. Ah, what am I reading? I am 
reading the the woman who wrote the again my dementia kicks in with authors um the woman who wrote the napolitan series of novels isabel elena elena ferrente oh, what's oh yes i know the yes woman. you know um yes one of hers that is about a um wife who is suddenly abandoned by her husband and i can't even remember the title do you know why because i read these on my kindle <laughs> Yes. This and you know when you read yes. this on your Kindle, you don't have it. You don't have. You're not looking at the cover all the you time. You don't have a connection it with nothing. it like that. It, no, you re- so it ends up don't... being lecture notes. Mm. Yes. <laughs> yes. I, I I think the days of the Kindle are, are numbered. Really, I think I may, I could be wrong, but I I find myself more and more enjoying a book just because I can quickly right. flick flick no back way. to different. <laughs> You know, different sections. Well, it just—it's very difficult. You come for my Kindle, and you, you, that's it. Like, but what if you want to write a little note, or you you want to go back to a page, or it's very hard to do yeah. that on a Kindle. It is. It's very hard. It's very hard to go back. You know, a couple of pages where you feel like when you feel like you've lost a thread. But isn't it that like life? Oh, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> that's isn't that the message we're being told? <laughs> <laughs> totally lost the thread. Well, um, Julia, where can people find you online? How can people follow your work? People can follow my work on uh, Sago Unplugged. That's S E S Z E G O, my surname, Unplugged, um, on Substack. And they can subscribe for free or they can pay me if they wish. And I want, per- I want to point people to a piece you wrote on uh, intergenerational womanhood, uh, yes. which was absolutely fantastic uh oh, thank I, you. it it was beautiful and it reminded me of because we are in the midst of some kind of uh conniption right now with all of these 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 uh topics of race and gender and reading your piece was it reminded me of a time when we could have that kind of writing we could have nice things and i was like this is great this is about something human and universal and but particular at the same time and and so yes uh thank you for that and i want everyone to read it thanks so much yeah i that was actually the last column i ever wrote for the age <laughs> i i picked that up i was like this might be the yeah. last one wow well what a well, that, what a fitting what a beautiful piece to go out on like, that's that's like yeah really great it was fitting thank you yeah. Well, we'll, uh, we'll provide links to, to all of those uh, in our show notes. Fantastic. Thanks, Julie. Great. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the New Flesh Podcast. If you like our work, please consider rating us on Apple Podcasts or even writing us a review. It really does help the show reach a wider audience. We'll be back with another episode next week. Until then, long live the New Flesh.